case, let's move along to our next keynote. The next uh, speaker lined up. Joao, are you ready? We have Joao Macedo. Welcome to the stage. Now, I want to activate your hands a little bit before we get you on stage, though. This is, this is what we call a waterfall. So let's start with one finger. Two fingers. Three fingers. Four fingers. All right, five fingers. We get a clap. Joao. Joao. <laughs> So um, Joao is president of Hope's, uh, Hope Zones. Are we up? That's okay. Hope Zones Foundation. Um, he is also the author of How to Be a Surfer, and he was the first professional Portuguese surfer to qualify for a World Surf League Championship. He is the co-founder and manager of Save the Waves Coalition, and has been instrumental in setting up the National Surf Park in Ericeira, and also the Surf Network in Azores as well. Tambang, boy, important stuff. This is like really groundbreaking stuff, or wave breaking, or I, I don't know. There's a terrible pun in there, but I'm a little, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm past my uh, my nap time, so um, I'll leave it to you. Thank you so much, Joel. Absolutely. Okay, uh, well, it's great. It's amazing everyone's still here. This is great shade. So, um, yeah, thanks for the intro. Um, I guess when we're really passionate about something, we just get involved and we dive in as... Uh, ah, we just dive in as uh, deeply as we can and, and do all that we can. And uh, surf conservation is this new area of, um, of, um, of conservation that connects to ocean conservation. And I think that surfers you know, really have a big role in terms of sharing this passion and finding ways that we can actually, uh, you know, help the oceans and be motivated for it. So I've, uh, over time, I've really seen that a lot of the conversation is about inspiring and not so much scaring people about the consequences. So there is tremendous urgency. We all, I mean, should know that and uh, it's real. But at the same time, the way that we can change is through inspiration and through experiencing nature. And then from that uh, moment onwards we, we can advance and so I just brought a couple of slides to kind of share a little bit um, of my world you know the ocean world and um, a little bit of how fear is much more um, prevalent in everything we do probably more than we'd like to admit but as big wave surfers we have to admit that we have fear because if we don't we normally don't survive and so uh, on that premises, uh, a, a lot of this exercise and what I'm going to share with you today are just some experiences that have helped me uh, overcome or at least transcend or at least live with the fear of, of giant waves. And so this wave, hopefully, oh, was a really special moment. This is uh, not the sound of the static, but this is a little bit of the teamwork that goes Wave and oh, okay. I think it's just so. It's more about the the speed that we're going at, and uh, you know, really all the senses. But what normally doesn't show up in the videos and uh, these images is what was happening before the days before. Uh, you know, everything that leads up to these fleeting seconds, which are exhilarating, and that's why we keep doing it and throwing ourselves over the ledge because it is obviously exciting and memorable, but the stress that comes before and the fear, it's the moments before, it's the days before. So this was a giant storm that was born off the coast of uh, North America. And those giant winds, super strong winds, creating the giant waves that then cross the Atlantic and end up in a zere. Yay, I made it. That was actually great. <laughs> um, and so, this is um, fear, right? Myth. And, um, and so what, in these days leading up to these giant storms, it's when we really feel it the, the most. And, um, you know, these storms, again, they start about four or five days is when we really start knowing that there's real data and that there's actually, you know, tremendous uh, waves that are approaching because there's very strong winds, you know, obviously the Atlantic is not the biggest ocean, but one of, and so we know that giant, giant waves are gonna come. And so these days leading up is, is what really moves us and the expectation and everything leading up to this morning, leading up to this moment is something that it's very difficult to manage. And we're trying to, you know, obviously stay calm, 
the fear factor is huge because you know we know the numbers we've been there so then it's uh you know and a lot of people asking you so you're gonna catch a giant wave huh? no worries right you got this and yeah sure of course i got it yeah no worries it's no problem we got this you know and so obviously the morning of then it's that lead up you know before this wave we had lost one of the guys in the team, I mean, he got a, a pretty severely injured. We almost lost a jet ski. This is on a borrowed board. So what I think here, and this we'll, we'll explore a little bit further, is that to have these environmental fights, we have to know how to adapt. You know, it's a bit cliche maybe, but it really is as real as it comes that on the day, and if it's a pressure moment, we really have to accept what's going on and be able to then transcend. And accepting we have to face our fears and so here the question that i that i make or or at least pose and try to share and hopefully it's useful for for all of us that's that's kind of the idea and uh i think um the values what are the values that we can tap into so values really are kind of um the the language that i think is more important for us to be able to explore these issues and so it's not so much what you do, but it's what you believe in. And values is about what you believe in. And more and more, um, I really think that the quest that we're on has definitely, and you know, being in giant surf and being immersed in nature, I think mo a lot of us have already felt this, but there really is a spiritual element to what we do. And I think I've really come very forward in that sense to share this you know, with a public uh, and a little bit out of the more kind of family environment because I think it's so important for us to accept this. And in this day and age, in these modern times, at the same time to accept that spirituality still not only exists, it's very important for us to tap into it. And big nature, so to speak, uh, is very connected to humbleness. And I think humbleness is not lack of confidence. It actually comes from a very strong place. And so if we're able to tap into this, you know, we can solve this problem. We can, you know, really attack climate change. Uh, you know, there's so many people that are, I don't like the terminology, but this direction that we're definitely going and that we're probably extracting more than we're giving back. And so the fear of this happening exists. And so we have to, again, use something that we can actually be practical about, you know, that we, when we all get together that we're able to, you know, accomplish goals, go further, perform. And so um, what, are the, what, what are these values? And so for me, the first value, and I'll, I'll do a little exercise with you guys, but um, I think hopefully um, similar to, well, I guess in terms of experiential, what, what Nick was doing here with us, um, gratitude, gratidão. So how does gratitude connect to performance? It's not a straight line, that's for sure. And, um, but what I do think it's very interesting for us to explore, and the exercise will kind of aim at that, is that if we find something that is like a core element that we can be grateful for, we can then practice this daily. And so what I think gratitude, uh, you know, and, and sometimes I've, I've done these speeches with the doctors and, um, you know, a doctor as a, uh, you know, a skill, a career, you'd imagine, gosh, they are bathed in gratitude, right? Because they're saving people's lives. So people are, you know, so happy and grateful for all the work they do. Um, and what one of the feedbacks was really interesting was that if you don't practice it every day, it goes away. It's not there. So you can't just be grateful when you are young or, you know, you say, I'm going to be grateful when I'm older. No, it has to be something that you actually do practice with a certain consistency and, you know, um, frequencies so that it has effect, so that it has impact on your life. And then once it has impact on your life, then you can help um, others around you. And so for us in big wave surfing, what we're more gratif grateful for is to breathe, right? Because underwater, we can't breathe. And so this for me, it's very simple, but it's actually um, really, um, really amazing because when you take uh, the, your ability to breathe, and that is probably one of the most primordial fears, then you really kind of understand that, okay, breathing is, is a pretty big deal. It's really, really nice. And, um, and so this exercise, we're basically gonna inhale and exhale a couple of times more, it knows the drill. <laughs> um, but um, what we'll do is about 20 times, so a little bit kind of vigorous, hopefully, so I can hear you. I, I, I'll, I'll be happy if that's the case. And then we'll have a, a, a short breath hold, okay? About five-minute breath hold. No, joking. <laughs> we'll try to do one minute, okay? 
And so the idea, obviously, this is not a competition or anything remotely like that. It's just kind of experiencing. If you go over 30 seconds, if you give up right away, just try to get back into it. No problem. Close your eyes. That's always kind of nice. It just kind of gets you in it. You're going to feel, hopefully, a little bit of silence and listening to a lot of, like, things that you probably wouldn't be listening to because we're all kind of quiet. Um, and then we just come back. And when you come back, breathe in, okay? And then that will be the end of the exercise. So the last breaths, you can exhale. It's a little bit harder. So you can end with an exhale or just an inhale. Exhale, obviously, is a little harder. Exhale is a bit more advanced, okay? So inhale through your nose. If you can uncross your legs and just kind of be in a comfortable position, so if you're doing this properly, you'll feel a little bit dizzy. That is, so those who are standing, um, exactly, that's the vigorousness we would need. <laughs> okay, so let's do I'll start the counting. In through your nose, out through your mouth. One, two, three, four, five, keep with me, six, seven, eight, Nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, last three, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Everyone still with me? Raise your hand. All right. Good breath. Okay, this is a pretty big wave. You're hanging in there really good, guys. Okay. Last 10 seconds. Still here, still here. All right. Five. Four, three, two, one. <laughs> All right, thank you guys. So it, it, it's a little bit tricky, but I think uh, we can get the gist of it, right? That, um, so how big was that wave? That was a great question, thank you. I appreciate that, because that was a really big wave. One minute, which is what we did right here, is a giant wave. So imagine 90% of surfers have never been one minute underwater. So imagine uh, close to the record under a wave is a minute 10, a minute 15. Obviously here we're in a really nice si safe environment and it's very quiet so time really is relative. So one minute under a giant wave is definitely extremely difficult to keep the calm that we were able to achieve here. But this is what we train. This is, this is what we do. And so um, I really think that when we hold our breath a little bit holder, uh, longer, I mean, uh, we, we are able, we need to really unplug. So we need to really be able to get into a meditative state. And the breath hold is kind of a forced meditative state. So we can't hold our breath for very long if we're, you know, uh, stressing out, our mind doesn't really slow down. So I tap into gratitude when I'm trying to hold my breath a little bit longer. So I just think, you know, we're able to almost not think, but there are always thoughts, so you can't completely eliminate them. And so um, hopefully this can be a, a fun takeaway. And so what, what can be other values, you know? What are other values that can help us transcend, transcend our fear? Maybe, Nick, how, how do you do it, Nick? How do you jump up here on stage and do, do, do what you do? What else, can, what else can we think about? I mean, I'm not putting you on the spot, but anyone else who wants to chime in? Any other ideas? How, how do you, tr yes, Amber? Courage. Courage, okay, okay, so just going for it, right? Knowing to just go. Believing. believing, okay, absolutely. So it's a value, you have to believe to overcome your fear. Yeah, believe Forgiveness. Forgiveness, wow, okay, okay. Forgive yourself, forgive others, absolutely. Okay, Nick? Yeah, play. Play, yeah. okay. 
you you just go do it. I, interesting. Super good. Yeah. The mission, the purpose, right? That does give you, it keeps you on track, steers you. Super nice. Yep. Resilience. Okay. Persistence, resilience. Yeah. Sticking in, sticking in, sticking out, sticking in. <laughs> the presence. Okay. To overcome. Baby steps, the process, right? Exactly, accepting the process, not only thinking about the results. Excellent, thank you. Sorry? Don't think, just do it. Yeah, exactly, spontaneity, instinct, all of those things, they, they tap in. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, again, what we're seeing here, there's no right or wrong in this. We all have our ways of overcoming our fears. So. This one is a little bit preparation, preparation. It's kind of the good student approach, right? So, you know, to, to be spontaneous, you normally have to have a lot of homework done so that then, you know, kind of to break the rules, you have to know them really well. And so that's along these lines. Um, and it's really cool because it really taps in, uh, and I'll get there uh, to what Nick, Nick was saying. But what, what I think preparation really does kind of filter a little bit just pure and, you know, so courage can't be complete unconsciousness. You know, it can't just be because then there's no consistency. We don't consistently perform. You know, we might be lucky. You know, we might get the cover shot. We might do, you know, get a giant barrel. But then it will probably be difficult to come back. It will probably be difficult to have a career sustained impact if it's just, you know, pure, pure, gust, you know, pure instinct, just pure spontaneity. To the fact that if you don't have it, there's also a flip side. And so, what I think the balance is between excessive preparation, so people who over-prepare, they stress out, they burn out, they, they can't you know, take it, they forget all these things, they stop having fun, they stop believing in their instincts. And so finding this balance between you know, really honoring the preparation, honoring the homework, honoring that that's fundamental, you can't just have talent, you have to have hard work, you know, all of these really primordial values that you know, structure us, we, even in surfing, it's obvious on the world tour, it's clear. You know, when you put in the hard work, you get better performances. You consistently get performances. And so um, the flip side is, again, if you over-prepare, you stop having fun. And so one of the values, and you'd say, gosh, this coming from a surfer, it's so obvious. I mean, why didn't you just say that right away? Because that's a little of the tricky thing, is that sometimes in whatever profession you are, you start really wanting to consistently perform and the tendency is to over stress out about it. And I had a case, I had just uh, qualified for the Big Wave World Tour or requalified. And um, you know, I was one of the favorites to win the Nazare contest and I had done a crowdfunding campaign and uh, you know, it had taken me to Puerto Escondido and uh, you know, I, I exposed myself. So I was asking people to help me kind of on this journey. And, and it was a really kind of, uh, intense, a new thing, and so I was preparing more than ever. You know, I had a, an amazing Muay Thai uh, coach. Uh, you know, I was doing everything. My apnea was better than ever. Uh, my gym work, my equipment was absolutely stellar. Um, and I mean, everything was like super, super sharp. And so the Nazare challenge came up, and uh, you know. I was being hauled as one of the favorite to win it, and it was that was really exciting, getting all that recognition. It was all fantastic. Um, but I was pretty stressed. I was pretty stressed with the expectations. I was pretty stressed with what was going on. And this value was really far from where I was mentally. And so when the contest day came, I, was, I changed a couple of things the night before that weren't very normal. So I wasn't really enjoying it. I wasn't enjoying the attention. I wasn't enjoying the fact that I had qualified. I wasn't enjoying the fact that I was actually there. I, I wasn't being able to tap into it. And I had one of the most debilitating accidents. I mean, I almost took me out completely. Um, I did make a comeback during the heat. I was stapled and came back in. And then, you know, it was a gruesome affair, the whole thing. And um, But, you know, it was something that uh, I absolutely gave my best. So I think everyone who supported me, you know, was knowing in that. But I completely lost track of this. And so it took me a really long time to understand the obvious is that if at this level of performance, if we aren't enjoying ourselves, we can't perform. So we rush our decisions. We're too stressed. We're not actually present. 
And I think this is one of those things that in whatever we do, whatever our career is, whatever we're doing, there are always some moments that can be fun. And we have to find them. Again, we have to go look for them and, and kind of enjoy them. The people we meet, you know, the travels we make. I mean, whatever it is that we have access to, we have to find it and enjoy it. And so for a professional surfer to say that, you know, and you'll probably start noticing this pattern uh, when their interviews are post-contest interviews, many times, oh, I was just having fun. And it, it almost sounds like fake, but it's not because it's so hard to do. You know, with all that pressure, the sponsors, this, the other, you know, it's very, very difficult to kind of like let go of all that and then just believe that whatever I do now, it doesn't really matter. All that I need to do is, is just enjoy this moment. And uh, having fun really is um, something hard to put into practice. Okay, so um, these values um, that help us transcend fear. And I think I'm coming to kind of my last value, or the one that's been inspiring uh, me o over these times. And I think it connects a little bit to the day today, you know, kind of uh, this issue that for us surfers, um, you know, thinking of the environment, being concerned about the environment is something that occurs really naturally. So, but it, it's something kind of uh, that surfers should and do naturally and uh, across the board, that's the case. But this is our case. I mean, if you live more in an urban environment, normally uh, human humanitarian reasons, you know, helping out with, um, you know, it can be helping out with, uh, you know, taking meals to elderly or doing something like this. And so what what's this umbrella? What value is this? It's the value of thinking not only about ourselves, but thinking about others. And so it's what I call service, service. So service to your community, service to whatever's around you actually frees you from your fears. So it, you can almost make it kind of almost like a, a selfish thing if, if, that, if that helps, and I think it should help because you have to take care of yourself. And so when you actually are able to service uh, the community, when you're actually able to go a little bit further, then in terms of you free yourself from your expectations, you free yourself from just being worried about your personal advancement or you know what you're doing in a certain moment and again for us it could be a clean up you know and when you do these things you really do free yourself up it's actually uh, liberating so uh, you nowadays you know with a lot of things being done with companies and companies really reaching out you know and sustainable goals and the importance that companies need to attract talent to motivate talent these things are really important to find them and propose them and be creative about how can we actually help people find service, you know, because that's a little bit, if you're very focused on your job, as you should be, you know, then it's up to also other operators, so to speak, other stakeholders, others to then come sometimes, be it companies, be it organizations, and propose solutions. How can they be immersed in nature? How can they go out and get motivated, you know, so that they do make the best decisions possible within the company? And so this is actually a reality that we're, yes, we're creating a shortcut for people, but there's a reason for this because they're very focused on their job. They're very focused on being successful within, you know, their career. And that's that's not only fine, that's very good. And it's important because that's performance. That's progression. And so by helping people reach uh, service and feeling good about that, it's actually something it's 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 a great um, it's a great contribution. And so with some friends, you know, Moritz is here. You can raise your hand here. Uh, <laughs> Um, we created we created hope zones, and this was kind of a surfer's attempt at uh, you know getting together and trying to do something that has impact. Again, there's so many projects around the world. The, the Global Wave Conference happened last week. You know, there's so many initiatives going on uh, around the world. The UN uh, you know uh, Ocean Conference went down. This initiative here, gathering so many like-minded people. I mean, what we're talking about is that there are these initiatives and. Once you go into that a little bit, that unknown territory, it's actually really positive, you know? So you are being brave, you're doing, you're transcending the fear and you are going out there and, and making an impact or asking for a sustainability, you know, job in a company that you would never think would be possible. Or as a friend of mine who was, uh, you know, um, a sustainable officer before this was actually more prevalent than Coca-Cola and he was laughed out of the room meeting after meeting after meeting and finally he had a breakthrough and he actually put lots of you know water fountains in a village in Africa you know the small victories that we actually do accomplish that they can measure they have impact and yes there's a lot going on but when you do that it really feels good 
And if you do it, keep doing it. If you don't, give it a try. And um, yeah, check us out if you have a chance. And uh, open to questions, if that's cool. Joao, thank you very much. Questions, anyone? Curious crowd, here we go. Just a compliment to, to I don't know, uh, usually um, these steps, I uh, usually do a kind of these steps as well, but I do in the end one thing very important, to celebrate those victories. So I think it's very important to feel blessed for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you for sharing. Any other questions? I know we have a curious crowd here. <coughs> What's the biggest wave you've you've held your breath through? <laughs> and how many tumbles did you go? Like <laughs> yeah, um, it's uh, I mean uh, it's um, it's probably the most um, the scariest you can imagine is knowing the anticipation of being crushed by a giant wave is something that really is not it's not it's not the fun part. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, you know, we kind of go from here to the gate of Paulo Riego underwater. I mean, tumbling probably like 10, 15 times. And um, I mean, it's probably the double of the chimney. And so to keep your calm when you're seeing such a giant body of water about to explode is, um, yeah, I'm really, you know, it's hard to be grateful in that moment. <laughs> um, <laughs> But that's uh, that's what we have to do, you know. And uh, it's it's full immersion. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> you, you mentioned staples. Yes. Where were you stapled? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that day uh, in Nazareth during the contest, that my surfboard hit me here in my temple, and uh, it completely blew up my head. I was really fortunate actually, that it wasn't any other part because I probably would have been knocked out. And then, um, I mean, I'm really grateful that I'm still here, you know. And so, uh, yeah. And then I really asked the doctor because I was conscious. He did some tests and, and it, everything, you know, seemed fine. They never did that again because they said they weren't allowed to legally to, to do something like that again because it was a head injury. <laughs> but I guess he, the doctor let me back in. And, and the, so they sta they had like a stapler with, uh, and they stapled me and let me go back out. And I almost made it through. It was really good. There was this Hawaiian guy who was pretty lucky. I think he was overscored, but, you know, that's that's life. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. Uh, when did you feel? Sorry. When did you feel the need, the urge to be more involved in this kind of sustainability? Uh, was it you went uh, for your favorite uh, place to surf and you found it? Well, this is not quite the same that I left the last time. Was it after a, a championship? You see it. <laughs> we have to share. <laughs> uh, the, um, you know, for me personally, I actually, uh, I, I run a surf school for many years, and um, we used to do cleanups. We used to be part of that. So it was something that was very ingrained. There was a key moment for me when I lived in California for some years in that I was working for a nonprofit called Save the Waves, and they helped develop what's called surf conservation. And so I felt it was really amazing that, you know, there was actually professional work being done to really f have fights for conservation and really, you know, do economic studies to prove the benefits that, you know, surfing can have for um, places. And, you know, this movement that was created, the World Surfing Reserves Movement, was basically uh, founded there. Hope Zones was something very interesting because I had gone through all of this and it was more about really narrowing down and trying to find something that we could really over time have impact. And so this was a lot of discussions, you know, Moritz and I were really, you know, the, the, the key engines. And, um, and so it was a lot of discussions. We took like three years to launch because it was a lot of discussions going back and forth, you know, what can we do? Because there's so much amazing work. So, I mean, to or, you know, steal the thunder or something like that or try, you know, and th there's a really positive side of a little bit of that 
management of nonprofits is being done like managements of companies. And so there is this, and that's why the global, I was mentioning the Global Wave Conference, because it's very interesting, because there's a very kind of competitive nature among surf conservation organizations. And what they understood by all getting together is, you know, this thing that is so spoken about, but that really is important, is the collaborative nature of these uh, ventures. And so the same way that companies get together and they create, you know, I wouldn't call them syndicates, but, you know, in some way they actually collaborate and they can share ideas and then un understand that they're part of the same movement. Although, yes, in the very short run, they might be competing for, you know, resources or something like that. It is this collaborative nature that really, and so we wanted to be very careful that we were finding kind of a niche, you know, an area where we could work. And so Nazare doesn't really have many or none, no environmental movements. And so it's a very complex area area to dream about a marine protected area but that's our vision and then the way that we get there is a little bit uh, long but that's kind of the entrepreneurial uh, knowledge and a bit of that m business mindset and that's you know kind of the exchanges that we had to try to find a way that we could um, really contribute and now we're trying to plant seaweed there uh, in a very kind of uh, kind of indirect way to help the fishing community to then be able to talk about marine protected areas. One last question, but also, have you tried kelp surfing before? Kelp, surf, kelp, kelp surfing. Kelp no, 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 no. So the, these big seaweed kelps, and you hold on for dear life as you get underwater. It's incredible. Kelp surfing. Yeah, I think you already answered um, my question, more or less. Thank you for that. Um, so what I think is a little bit sad about this type of events is that we are like-minded people. We are change makers. And my question would be, how do you use your the attraction and fascination for the sport surf for social responsibility to like get out of the bubble, you know, to bring people to these events, for example, that have no touch point with sustainability yet? No, that that's a great question, and and um, I think. Um, I mean, personally, I was explaining a bit of my personal journey. So by running a surf school for many years in uh, in Praia Grande, we actually, at Hope Zones, we, we developed, uh, you know, a theme that unites these two uh, organizations uh, uh, in the sense that it's making the ocean experienceable. And so um, when I left uh, California and I was moving here, I was a little bit away from environmental movements. And that was a little bit exactly what you're saying. You know, there's a bit of... There, there are bubbles and that's, you know, essential too so that we stay focused on what we're doing. But at the same time, it's kind of difficult to perceive the impact and perceive what we're doing. And so a friend of mine, he wrote this amazing book called Blue Mind. And it's about the science behind contact with blue surfaces. And he was a, a very uh, big mentor for the World Surfing Reserves movement. And he really shared with me one thing which uh, to this day sticks with me and it helps me uh, kind of, um, you know, answer a little bit this question that, that, that you made and that I think should be constantly made. Um, and it's when you experience nature. And so what we do is we're just open during the summer and people just come and they go surf. And so there's actually a pretty heavy logistics, you know, the surfboards, this, uh, you know, having coaches, gi giving, you know, the coaches, knowing how to do it. And the ocean at Praia Grande is pretty rough, but that's probably why, uh, you know, we're there. So it teaches you not only this kind of short-term gratification, there's a little bit of a process, but obviously people are there to have fun. So we have to contextualize this and if you get your ass completely kicked that you're still <laughs> somehow enjoying it because again, you're learning how to be in the ocean. You're learning how to move in the ocean. And uh, I think this really is part of uh, the future of our movements and the growth uh, and it's in the cities and we have to be able to extract people from the cities and take them to nature and be able to find how to do this, uh, you know, in a consistent way and a way that also progresses. So a lot of the times it, it is a one off. And so it is difficult to maintain this sustained connection. And so, you know, Kashkaj had a, a wonderful, based actually uh, a lot on the Blue Mind teachings. They, you know, took a lot of kids to Kirkavel. My school was running that program for some years. You know, and initiatives keep popping up, and, and that's what's needed, you know, to go walk in the Sechet Sintra. I mean, here in Portugal, we really are extremely lucky because the logistics compared to other big cities is, you know, 
very, very uh, privileged and, and blessed. But uh, still, it still is transportation. We still have to, you know, take kids or whoever it is from point A to point B and then make them safe. And so all of that, uh, I think, really galvanizes and, and keeps us opening, you know. So we have to keep the, the bubble has to be open. And ocean, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Experience ocean through ocean liches. Joao, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, one, all right, one last one. Richard, we're going to sneak you in. Hey, Joao, thank you so much. Um, you spoke a lot about fear, and fear is something it's great that you speak about because it's something that it's hard to talk about because you don't want to paralyze people, but on the other hand, it's real, and especially if you're at the forefront of what's happening in climate change, it's terrifying to be there. Um, and I was just wondering, as you were talking, well, it's such a strong emotion. What is... Is there an emotion stronger than fear? And I was thinking it's probably hope. So when you came to your hope zones, it was like, ah, oh, I can totally see how you've gotten that connection. And you're obviously bringing a lot of hope within the surfer community. And I'd love to know, outside the surfer community, where are you getting hope? Where are you personally seeing hope? That's not your area where you go, oh, I can see they're kind of going in the same direction as me through it completely different area. So what's your, what are the other hope zones that you're seeing? Um, yeah, that, thank you. Thank you. I, that's, um, well, I, I would say, you know, technology for me is something that um, I think the conversation about sustainability is an efficiency also conversation. And so when I see, you know, businesses transforming waste into products, you know, the whole thing about the landfills. And so all of that area and that that for me is one of the things that gives most hope because, you know, garbage is such a uninteresting and I mean, it's it's garbage right so i mean it's but then suddenly there are these companies that jump into it you know and literally and go and extract and make garbage actually valuable and i think if that's possible anything's possible you know it's it, it's that kind of thing and so um it's very connected to ocean so waste management is you know absolutely a direct vessel to ocean conservation and then it's these gatherings you know when people get together and when the like-minded people have to get together and re-energize themselves and you know and learn and understand about different projects and different ways of accessing you know that hope and because that that really is uh you know uh, it's a stone right it's something that you know we can really count on and as long as we're here you know we're breathing and we can be hopeful absolutely Beautiful. Thanks, Joao. I thought we could send you off with a Mexican wave. Because we, we have the Mexican to start us off. <laughs> so we're going to start off with a Mexican wave here. <laughs> One, two, three, go. And it's going around again. It's going around again. Hold your breath. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you.